The Lens is teaming up with WWNO-FM to conduct these candidate forums, one for each district, to allow candidates the chance to express their views on education and to talk to each other. In this district, we have Nolan Marshall, a longtime business owner who has more than a 40-year business relationship with the public schools, Kwame Smith, a substitute teacher and former Lusher Charter School basketball coach, and Thomas Robichaux, a local attorney who is currently the president of the Orleans Parish School Board. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for having us. Thank you. I'll begin by asking a question and allowing each of you to respond. Try to keep your responses succinct. Um, we'll conduct this somewhat like a panel discussion. Try to wait for you, me to recognize you before jumping in. And my first question, you know, pertains to governance. Um, I want to know if you think schools should return to the Orleans Parish School Board as charters or as traditionally run schools. Please elaborate when responding, and Nolan, I'll allow you to go first. I believe uh, charters, in theory, are uh, an excellent way to educate our kids. It allows for, uh, if it's done right, it allows for community participation in the governance of the school, which is which would be great. Whether it's it's actually done that way, that would that remains to be seen. Uh, it's a it's an experiment right now. I believe it has great potential, but we have to make sure that uh, the charters are as accountable as all other schools, whether they direct run or charter. Kwame, you want to chime in? Uh, I think all the schools should come back to Orleans Parish School Board. Uh, I think they should come back more as traditional schools. Uh, I think there is some room for choice. Not quite certain if I would say I agree with the charter model as it is, but what the charter model may have been initially thought of, something that's a community uh, partnership with teachers and educators, not so much private institutions or private businesses. Thomas? Um, well, the schools that are coming back have greatly improved. That's why they're eligible to come back. And so if they have a work, a model that works and they're succeeding, I see no reason to mess with that model. If they're, if they're a charter, as when they're eligible to come back, then they'll stay a charter when they come back. Um, if they're traditional when they're eligible to come back, then they'll stay a traditional when they come back. What do you think the school board's function should be going forward to run schools, to be a support to charter schools, both? Um, Thomas, since I started with Nolan last time, I'll start with you now. Well, it's a dual function. Um, it's both the things you just said. Uh, we do run traditional schools, and we do have a responsibility to, that, to those schools. Also, uh, but you know, we're also moving our traditional schools into a more autonomous situation already, where we're empowering the principals and teachers to make more decisions at the local level, at the school level. Um, but as far as the charters go, we have two, a twofold responsibility. One is the accountability system, and two is the services. We have to provide certain services to all of our schools, and then we provide services that the charter schools can opt into. So it's, it's, a, it's a dual function for the charter schools, and it's an even bigger function for the traditional schools. Kwame, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yes, I would like to say that um, the responsibility, I think, for the Board of Education is to run our public schools, all our public schools. Um, just like the other parishes amongst the state of Louisiana are run by their local school boards, I think that's important because the school board actually is a place where people in that community can obtain uh, what we call employment, okay? It's a way of helping with economics within your community. So being that if the school board runs all the schools, that would, in my opinion, give more local opportunity for um, employment and, you know, sharing of the wealth inside our community. Okay. Nolan, do you have anything to add? Well, the first thing we always have to keep in mind is what's, what's best for children. And, uh, you know, Public education has always been an experiment. Uh, I've been in it for the 40 years, and 40 years, every every five years there's a new model, from small learning communities to site-based management, you know, and all have had some success and all have had some failures. Uh, right now, the, the model is, is, is charters. And I think if, if we, the public, get involved with education, neighborhood associations, parent organizations, get involved with public education, any model will work. And if we don't, I don't believe any model 
Okay. We'll be successful. I want to get around to the composition of the Orleans Parish School Board. Um, Nolan, maybe we can start with you. Do, should school board members be elected or appointed or a mix of both? Well, again, you know, you, uh, you talk theory. Mm -hmm. I believe we definitely need to have elected officials as part of the equation. But I, I personally uh, would like to also see some board members appointed. Um, uh, those appointees should have some expertise in education uh, that would help balance the board. The board represent the people and the communities that they serve and also have some appointees on the board that, that bring a level of expertise to the board. And if you don't mind my asking, who would they be appointed by or who would you prefer? Well, you know, I, I think it's very important that, that the mayor be involved in education. I could see where the mayor could possibly have have uh, two appointees, uh, and maybe even the, the city council could have two appointees. I don't have a real uh, in stone feeling about this. I just think that if we could develop a model with community consensus, uh, that would give us some appointees on the board that have some expertise. I think it would it would help the board make some decisions. Kwame, do you agree or disagree? Uh, I would say that I disagree. I just think that a elected school board is fine. Seven districts, I think, are fine. Maybe we can look at maybe redistricting, maybe going to eight, you know, or maybe if we want to go down to six, it all depends on, I think, what um, the study or research show based upon populations here in New Orleans. But I believe that a uh, elected school board is enough. What about you, Thomas? Well, I absolutely believe that the only way that they, uh, any again in Louisiana appointed board members and commission members, no matter where they are, are not beholden to the people, but they're beholden to the person who has appointed them. We see it uh, all over the place in every aspect of our government. And um, I, it's very clear to me seeing the Recovery School District, the Bessie Board, the OPSB, and the charter system. Um, that the only real accountability is through an elected board. Um, now, the seven, we just went through the redistricting. We have seven members now. It's going to stay that way for the next 10 years. Uh, there was no motion or movement this last year to change that when we redistricted. Um, I would not mind seeing it, see the number change, but I'm very, very staunch advocate for district representation and for elected board members. I have one other yeah, problem. go ahead and elaborate, Nolan. Okay, uh, I believe that the, the elected members of the board should outweigh, be able to outvote any appointed position so that the power would still remain with the elected officials. But I do believe that it's, it's uh, important. I believe it's important that the mayor share the burden of, of education. It's the number one issue in our community. It's the one that would impact poverty the most. It's the one that would impact crime the most. It's the one that impacts economic development the most. And I think the, the most powerful political position is the mayor's office and the city council. And I, I could see where they could, could appoint people from the universities uh, that have expertise in education that could help the board make decisions concerning education. Otherwise, you have people that run for, for office and sometimes they have no no experience. They're professional people, but they don't understand kids. Now, I'm different because I've worked with them for 40 years. Teachers, principals, superintendents, they've all been my friends. We've talked education for the last 40 years. I've served on multiple boards, and but I'm, I'm unique. I'm not the average person running for school board. Kwame is a, uh, an educator, so he's unique, but we don't have very many educators that run for school board. Thomas, to just introduce a question that I hadn't thought about before, do you think that your um, background as an attorney in any way, you know, hinders your ability to be able to relate to and understand the experiences? Oh, of absolutely not. I think, it, in fact, it's a, it's a big benefit. Uh, one, I've been through the educational system myself for not just a, a high school and undergrad, but, um, but uh, a graduate school as well. In addition, my entire uh, professional career, even going back to law school, has been studying governmental operations and how government works and how it's supposed to work and how it works correctly and how it, how it fails. And so I bring a wealth of knowledge in this area that no one has uh, on the board or any of, the, any of the candidates in any race. 
and, and, it, and it's a really unique uh, knowledge set. And um, I'm one of the few people with that knowledge set uh, in town. So I'm very happy and proud to uh, bring that, that knowledge set to the board. Okay. Um, so my next question is specifically about the Orleans Parish School Board. What do you think are some of the things that just in the last four or maybe eight years that, you know, OPSB has done well? And what do you think are some of the ways that they can improve? And Kwame, I'll start with you. Well, first of all, I think we need to talk about what they've been doing well, okay? Now, I haven't seen much change, in my opinion, about what we're doing well. The schools that OPSB has been running directly or even chartered over the past few years has been a very small select group. And the same group that we've seen pre-Katrina, that was selective and also successful during those times. So when we talk about vast improvements, I think the only area we can talk about, I guess, is when we talk the fact that we've gotten out of debt, okay? Um, we have a great bond rating, but when we talk about our academic achievement, you know, it's kind of relative. We want to look at the number of schools that we actually are serving and the number of schools that we do get credit for when we talk about our achievement in reference to those schools that we do directly run as the Board of Education. But when we look at all the schools in New Orleans, we talk about the improvement that we've had. It hasn't been a really large improvement. It's been some improvement, but yet still not to the level where they say that most of our schools are considered passing or failing using the rubric that we use, SPF scores and, and test scores. So with that being said, yes, there have been some improvement in areas, but it's very relative to when you compare what we had pre-Katrina, the type of rules and regulations we were running by then, the type of schools being neighborhood and traditional then, versus what we have more of a 90% charter model that has different ways that they handle the same situation when we talk about admission, we talk about expulsion, we talk about movement between schools and with children and with parents and a different type of population that we have now pre-Katrina, post-Katrina. So when we try to compare the two, sometimes we talk about apples and oranges, something I don't think many people have really, really brought out. But when we talk about where do we need to improve, that's when we really have to get into the tough work of getting down to how does this affect boots on the ground, parents and students in the community, teachers and students in the classroom. And that kind of brings us back to the question that we had before that we were talking about experiencing what type of makeup we should have with the board, uh, the whole understanding of our way. Maybe we're going to appoint some people. Well, I think we should stay with elected, but I think those people on the board should have some type of experience with boots on the ground. If not everyone, some of those people on that board. So I know that, well, it might be great that you have a great set of skills and be an attorney, but that's what you hire legal counsel for for the board. And, you know, with that being said, I think it's time for educators to be on the Board of Education. That's one improvement. Okay. Well, Nolan, do you want to um, now respond on what do you think the Orleans Press School Board should improve on versus what it um, has done well? Well, the, the, I think they need to do a much better job of hiring a superintendent. That's, that's where it starts. Uh, we had an opportunity to hire an excellent superintendent some years ago. Her name was Ali Tyler. Uh, we didn't think she was uh, talented enough to run our school system, but yet she could uh, go and be the deputy superintendent of the whole state and be the active superintendent. Thought she should have been the superintendent for the state. Uh, I've known them all. I've, I mean, I've had conversations with, with them all. And they get, we had the same conversations. It's about career and college prep. Get our kids ready to go to work regardless of what kind of people they are, whether they're good citizens uh, or not. You know, we need to have a much broader conversation about what we're doing in our schools, the programs that we have for our, our students, and how we engage them. Uh, will there be people that will volunteer in their community when they leave? Will there be leaders? Are we, are we growing future leaders? Uh, we, much have, we need to have a much broader conversation about education and what our educational goals are. The goals are the same for everybody. They have an excellent school in every community uh, so that you don't have to send your kid across the, 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 the river or somewhere to, to receive an excellent education. But what does an excellent education mean? That's the conversation that we haven't had and that's the conversation that we need to have. Uh, if we did that, then when we hire a superintendent, we can actually know 
what skill sets that superintendent needs to bring to the table. What is that superintendent's vision for education? Does he really believe in community engagement? And does he re really believe in, does he have a track record of developing the whole child? Those are the things that, that we need to discuss as a community. And uh, if we did that, I think we would improve tremendously as a board. Thomas, do you want to chime in on what do you think OPSB's done well versus what do they need to improve on? Uh, certainly, certainly. There's a lot of things that we've done very well. Um, for, for instance, <clears throat> as, as Mr. Smith uh, mentioned earlier, we went from near bankruptcy to having a uh, AA plus bond rating. This was not uh, an easy overnight fix. This took several years of effort. Um, we also have actually the highest rate of improvement of any district in Louisiana over time. So if you look back, if you take a look at us from the takeover of the RSD, of, all, of the majority of schools, and look at the rate of improvement over five years, six years, it's by far the highest rate of improvement uh, of any district in the state. Um, and, and so, you know, remember that after the RSD took over, the, the state took over all the schools, or most of the schools, uh, we were still about number 25 in the state, and now we're number two overall. So that's a big, big jump, and that's not an accident either. You know, that took a lot of effort, a lot of work, a lot of concentrated, um, directed effort to make that happen. Um, <clears throat> and it's not just because of charter schools, and it's not because of uh, the traditional schools, it's a concerted effort. Um, we also have uh, a zero tolerance anti-bullying policy that we've implemented in the last four years. We've updated every year. Uh, we are on top. We have uh, technology, high-tech classrooms. Every classroom is a high-tech classroom. They have smart boards. They have computers. Uh, we're moving to iPads now. Um, they have interactive uh, homework in a lot of the schools. And uh, we are. Our goal has been for the last four years that I've been on the board to kind of outreform the reformers. You know, they said that the, we couldn't succeed. We couldn't fix this system. And what we've done, and, and they wanted us to go away. They wanted us to either be appointed or to be dissolved completely. And what we've done is be so successful at, what, at, at our task that they can't ignore us anymore. Because we are now a, a, one of the best districts in the state. That's the number two overall. We have the highest graduation rate in the state, highest cohort graduation rate in the state. And uh, so we're doing a lot of things very, very well. Now, what do we have to improve on? Um, a lot. Uh, we are not, I'm not saying we're perfect in any way, but we are so far down the right path that we really need to keep going and make sure that, that this continues, this improvement rate continues. If we keep this rate of improvement, we will be a nationally ranked system in the next four years. And that's my, that's, that's my goal. Last four years ago, I promised to make us the number one district in the state. We kind of touched that ceiling, but we haven't quite, quite passed it. This time, I'm saying we're going to be a nationally ranked system in four years. So that's the first time that I've heard that Dolly's Parish. Go ahead, go right, go I, ahead. I, Nolan I like wants to. This. Nolan wants to chime in on what I, I Thomas like, just I like said. The, I like this format. Mm -hmm. Go back and forth. Great, better than the rest. Um, we have schools without parent organization. Haven't had one for the last five, six years. Uh, haven't had student council. To me, that's that's absolutely wrong. Uh, we, we do have Promethean boards in every, every classroom. And first, the RSD had Promethean boards in all of their classrooms right after Katrina. Wow. Then all these parents say, hey, they can't outdo us. We have Promethean boards. Do you know that 80% of the Promethean boards aren't used in the schools? I mean, it, just throwing technology and throwing money at it doesn't solve our kids' problems. You know, Kwame and I talked the other day about how do you, how do you solve the problem of 80% of the kids coming to school unprepared to learn. Only 20% of the kids are motivated to learn. That's a huge problem that nobody talks about. And what are the answers to those? That's why I think we need to have a much broader conversation about what's going on in the schools, in the classrooms, besides just preparing them for career in college. It's more than just what goes on in the classroom and the tools and the technology that you have. And if we don't do that, then we're missing the mark, okay? And we need more time to talk about that than the half an hour we have. But, uh, 
Well, I do want to say I don't disagree with you. Um, Thomas is, is speaking. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Go right yeah, ahead. I don't disagree with you about uh, about what you, your assessment there, but I I want to um, I want to emphasize that the system has been so tragically neglected for 50 years that we have had to go back to the basics. We had to set up our foundation, our financial foundation, and our, our academic foundation, and move forward from there. We had to start basically at the beginning with a lot of this stuff. And so while I, I don't disagree with you about how, you know, we need a more conversation about how to motivate the children and how to get the parents involved uh, more and uh, how to make sure that, that a higher percentage of them are ready to learn when they walk in the door, um, those are all things that we do have to work on, and we do have to converse more on that. But those are on the academic side that are under the superintendent and under the charter directors. Uh, we can only push that. We cannot mandate it. We can do it, some of it in policy for our traditional schools, but we can't just twist. We can twist arms, but we can't force them to do it. Uh, but that is something. But as a board member, as a board, and as a board member, that's our. That's one of our, our duties is to advocate and push for these things. But we have to do it in a deliberate fashion. We have to get our fundamentals correct first. You know, uh, there's a lot of groups and a lot of clubs at, at different, that don't exist at, at schools in this parish that I think should exist. You know, there's not 4-H and there's not uh, GSLs and there's not um, um, Ag Club and, uh, and FHA and, and, and FFA and these kinds of things. And these, these are important groups for, for kids to learn from because these are not just groups that they have fun in. They learn, they learn in these groups also. And so uh, it's, it's very important that we get our fundamentals first and then we, as we go forward with, with this great uh, transformation of the school system, we work on getting, making sure all those things fall into place correctly. Can I move on or did you have something? Well, wrong? It's going to be kind of hard to move on. I sit here and I listen to my opponents and they talk about a lot of issues, uh, like you're saying, dealing with motivating kids, getting parents involved. And then I noticed him made the reference to about what we cannot mandate and what we can mandate, in reference to us having what we consider traditional schools. And it creeps in, but we don't like to sit on that situation. The situation about having traditional schools versus the charter schools, which you cannot mandate much with them, except for the fact that they have to just be held accountable for performance schools. But how they get about doing it is up to them. They have that, that latitude in return for just making sure you bring up performance scores. But the issues that we're really having that we nearly need to talk about when we talk about engagement, we talk about the community, you got to talk about trust. People in the community do not feel that the school model that we have right now, the way it's set up, that these the, the providers have to really engage before they make decisions. They're being told what's going to happen instead of sharing what's going to happen. And I believe this is problematic and systematic because of the system we have in place. When you talk about accountability to the community, you're talking about elected officials. Those schools don't have those elected officials, so there's no accountability to them. But all we have is a contract with maybe the Bessie board or maybe the RSD board or even the OSBB board. But the point that I'm trying to make is we need to move to something that's more uniform where we get underneath one unified school, public school district, and we have policy that affect all schools that they have to follow. Good example, the one app was a failure. The reason why it's a failure is because we're still fi fiddling around trying to figure out what schools got what kind of population, where they should have been, why they're not over here, and, oh, this school was supposed to be closed, but they still have room. All those questions are out there because of the model and the system we have. Going back directly to Orleans Parish would be great, number one. Number two, trying to get back to more traditional models with some choice there. How that choice is, still out to discuss, okay? But we need to get back to basics that give people in the community stability, understanding and direction. Many people are lost, don't know what to do with their children when they get kicked out of one school, where do I go next? What is my recourse? What's my first choice? Can I have that? And we need to change choice to chance because we're only talking about a chance to get to your first, first choice that you want. Then you have a chance to get in your neighborhood because you don't have any traditional neighborhood policy that says that you live here, you can go here. You can choose to go somewhere else, but if you live here, you go here. You made so many good points. <laughs> and I just want to go back to one point that you made about the... Um, 
the fact that charter school boards um, are not elected and the fact that you know you aren't they aren't held accountable at least in that way um, in the same way that the traditional school board is held accountable and I want to know you three's thoughts on you know how can charter school boards work to include more of the community in their decision making should they be doing that if so is it you know is it as simple as adding a parent voice to the board how I mean what are some of your strategies or some of your what, would, what advice would you give to charter schools in order to go about that Nolan did you want to well I, I uh I have a wealth of experience. And I, I, you know, I was at the table when they when they were going to close Joseph S. Clark High School. Uh, and I, I got with the Alumni Association and we worked to keep the school open. But the school was still failing. So they were given a choice to close it, that they were going to close the school or they, you needed to think about chartering. You didn't have to charter, but think about it. That's when they, they met with the first line group, and I was with them throughout the entire process. For me, it's always been about community involvement. And through that process, uh, working with the alumni from the very beginning, if you were doing this to keep the school open to feel warm and fuzzy about having some place that you could call your school, that's one thing. I don't want any part of that. If you want to keep it open so that you can be involved to help these children improve the school, then I'm with you. And they, they signed on and we worked. We worked with the first line group through a process that was facilitated by NSNO. And they came periods, came to periods with uh, where the trust issue came <coughs> up. The community wanted certain things about the finances to be reported once a month. And Jay Altman was the CEO of First Line was, well, wait a minute, you know, I, I, how can we do this? That's too much work and, you know, it was a trust issue. He didn't trust the people what they were going to do with the information. And when it was pointed out to him that, hey, Jay, you're here asking these people to accept you, that you're trustworthy, that you're in it for the right reasons, you have to turn around and trust the community that they're here at the table for the same reasons to help the kids. So they were able to work together and form a, a, a great MOU. I ask, I would invite anybody to look at the MOU between the Joseph S. Clark Community Council and the charter organization to deal with all of the issues Kwame mentioned, enrollment, uh, retention, uh, programs, uh, future site, all of the things that, that parents or communities should be involved with they're at the table to discuss all of those issues with them. Matter of fact, the, the alumni president for the Joseph S. Clark High School is now on the board of, of First Line. That's how you get community engaged. That's how you marry them. That's theory. That's how it should work in theory. Now, whether, whether they, they hire good educators and whether they educate the kids or not has yet to be, be seen. It, it's still a, a, a test. But to marry the community to the organization should be the goal, to have true community engagement so that when there are problems, that they resolve those problems together. That's the way charters are going to be successful, and that's the way it's, schools are going to be successful. And that, that's what, what I think we need to do as a, as a board. Thomas, what do you think about um, char the, the way charter schools can include more community, um, either on their boards or in their decision making? Well, I tell you, the charter boards are supposed to be public meetings. When they meet, it's supposed to be public meetings. They're supposed to advertise them just like we are supposed to and, uh, and publicize when the meetings are and the agenda and all that stuff according to the open meetings laws. Um, there's been a kind of a little fight because a lot of them don't want to do that. Um, both uh, all, and I'm talking about not just OPSB but RSD, all, all the charter groups. They're, they're, they're all kind of uh, secretive in a way, you know. Uh, so. Um, they've been resistant to it, but uh, ours have come around, uh, at least for the most part, they have come around to that, and um, that's the first step. And you, so you've got to publish when your meetings are, the P and they need to be at a regular time and place. You know, our meetings is for the school board on the third Tuesday every month, uh, the, the committees are the Thursday before. You know, if you don't have a regular meeting, then uh, people don't know when to go. And if you move it around, people, you know, they forget, they don't want to go. And if you get in the habit of not knowing when it is, then you don't show up. So that's step one. Uh, the other part is I think, I do think that there should be 
parental involvement on every charter board. Every single charter board should have a parent on there. Um, and, uh, and I think that, the, that it would probably be wise to have someone in the community on there, you know, from, from that neighborhood. If they have a neighborhood district, there should be someone representing the neighborhood uh, on, in that, on that board, too. Uh, because, you know, s there's sometimes conflicts between the schools, the charters, and the neighborhoods. Uh, especially if they're with this, all these construction projects we have going on. You know, the neighbors don't like what this design or that design or, or whatever. So those are two basic, e pretty easy things to do. Um, but as far as, as, and then you have to, as far as engaging the public generally, there just needs to be more outreach. There has to be more outreach by the charter boards to invite people to their to their um, to their meetings, um, but it, there's a there's a there's a paradox there because um, they are charter boards, and so you have a the people who are interested in that is a much smaller group in a particular charter school than the whole city, you know, with the, with or the whole parish with the, with the school board. So you've got. The, the parents of the students that go there, you've got the people in the neighborhood, um, and you don't have a whole lot of other people that, that really are interested in, in doing in, in attending those things. And, 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 and that's, needs to be, that's why there needs to be more outreach, because pe people need to know what is going on in these charter meetings. Okay, we have a limited amount of time left. Kwame, do you want to respond to the question? Yeah, you asked about how we can... Um well, what would you do? What would be the plan? I think we definitely need to have those boards uh, open up to parents, community reps, and also student reps, and put that, I would think, not on an appointment basis, but also an election basis. I think it opens up the democratic process. It reaches out and get people involved. I think engagement happens when you see that there's a true, honest opportunity for me to get involved, and it's not something that, if I know the right person, I just get appointed. So that's when we talk about right at the air, at the schools. I believe that site-based management should be more than enough for any school, need be it be a traditional school or need be it a so-called charter school. The issue really is about the money. The charter provider wants to have control of the money. Since they want to have control of the money, you have to have the autonomy to go with it. So when they start talking about autonomy, they're talking about money. They can run their schools, choose their curriculum, run their school the way they see fit, but it doesn't mean that they have to have control of the money. That's why I think we should go back to an elected local school board, look to give the schools autonomy, which I think we have been doing for some time, with principals have always, in my experience of being in the school, running the school, in charge of the school. And the decision making is made by his team, which I think should have a site-based team that includes more people from the community. So we can strengthen schools with decision making. That's not hard to do. We can get more parents involved. That's not going to be easy, but it can be done. But the whole discussion really falls back on that whole autonomy and control of authority of money. And that's why you hear a lot of barking from charter providers not wanting to fall in line because they want to be able to do what they want to do and not be told. Do we have time for closing statements? Sure. So I want to allow each of the candidates to give kind of their last impression to voters. You know, explain why people should vote for you, what makes you stand out from the opponents. Um, Nolan, if you want to go first. Well, you know, I, again, I bring a, a wealth of experience in working in the schools, actually serving on boards, uh, you know, parent organizations, alumni associations. I've, I've done it all in, in, in education. Uh, with direct run charters are, are not going to work unless we involve the parents. I know how to do that. I, that's what I've, what I've been doing. But the board needs to focus more attention on it. The only, the only, you go to direct run and you have a principal that's in the school, you change the superintendent and the superintendent comes in and changes to small learning communities. Now the teachers and everybody have to learn a whole new methodology of, of working with kids. Change the superintendent, another superintendent comes in with a whole other plan. Charters, I think, would give some stability to it because if the charter lasts and it stays, it's going to have a model and it's going to keep working at it. And you can share it through the, model, through the school system, school board over the charter schools. They can share the, the, the ones that are being successful 
with the others. We need to be a support organization that will support them and get the parents and everybody involved in it. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's hard to explain it all in a minute and a half, but I've got some definite ideas uh, about how to do all of those things, and uh, I know the kind of superintendent that we need to make it work, and I want to be part of that, that decision-making process. Thank you. Thomas, did you want to give your last impression? Sure. Uh, I want to thank all the, uh, your listeners and uh, all the online, the people watching the streaming online. Um, uh, for taking the time to, to pay attention to this important election. Um, my name is Thomas Robichaud. I'm currently the president of the Orleans Parish School Board. I represent District 7. And uh, I want to tell the, the, the listening public that it is so important that you turn out and vote for this in this election. We must keep this stu the schools on the right track in this education reform movement. We must continue the upward trajectory of the schools and the improve, rates of improvements, the graduation, the economics, everything must continue. If they don't continue, this whole city is doomed. Education is the key to poverty, economics, crime, racism, sexism, uh, homophobia, everything you can think of that's bad with our society, education is the key to it. And that's our goal, is to make this the best educational system in the country. Kwame, your last words? Well, my last words, uh, my name is Kwame Smith. I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana, the seventh boy. Born and raised here, went to public schools, taught for 17 years and coached for 20. My experience, once again, makes it possible for me to ask for your vote, those inside my district, your support for those outside my district, to ask those to vote for me inside my district. New Orleans is a collection of neighborhoods and schools. That is our culture, in addition to jazz and music and red beans and gumbo. But the bottom line is, vote for someone who has experience inside and outside the classroom, who's walked with you, that understands you. That's what you need on the board. Someone who can fight for you and knows your plight and knows your pain. That's all I'm saying. Number 94, Kwame Smith. Thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having us. Very good. Thanks.